The YouTube algorithm is a near-perfect reflection of alienation in the capitalist mode of production. By alienation, we mean not only the inversion of the subject and the object, but the perpetual externalization of a process from its origin. The algorithm, born presumably of informational exchange between creators and viewers, becomes a subjectified object. Let's unpack exactly what all that means. Subject and object can be taken literally here. The subject performs an action on an object the same way that students of grammar would be familiar with. In this case, content creators produce content and viewers consume it. At the start, then, it is people that are performing the actions. The verbs, words of action, are to produce and to consume. The product of the creator's actions is a video, the object that viewers then consume. There is, in some sense, an exchange here. Creators provide entertainment, information, or some other useful experience to viewers, who in turn provide their attention to the creator's work. In the early stages of YouTube, this is precisely how things operated. Of course, as we now know, this exchange has become increasingly monetized, not only through embedded ads, but through promotional attachments and direct viewer-creator money transfers. Today's viewers therefore provide creators monetary remuneration, on top of their attention and commentary. Importantly, the creator-viewer relationship was primarily user-driven in the early stages of this platform. Viewers chose the media they wished to consume, while creators produced the media they found creative realization in and hoped to share with their audiences. Gradually, however, the monetization of the exchange of content marketized the creative space. This marketization introduced incentives that relentlessly dissolved the connections between creators and viewers. Most critically, the marketization injected a new logic, the logic of capital, into the creative space. More than ever, the objective of the creator is to maximize views and draw in new viewers. To this end, the efforts of creators have become skewed towards attracting the biggest possible audiences, rather than creating something entertaining, educational, or even provocative. So far, it would appear that the subjects are still performing the actions, albeit for different purposes. Creators are still producing videos, and viewers are still watching them. Already, though, the relationship between the creators and viewers has been jeopardized. Creators are not as focused on sharing their work with viewers as individuals, but on growing ever bigger audiences and generating more clicks. As an additional layer of purpose, creators are now also concerned with generating revenue, which derives directly from clicks and views. Creators therefore seek clicks, views, and most likely money. This is already a subject-object relationship, rather than a relationship between two subjects. The dynamic evolves even further with the introduction of the algorithm, a mystified string of programming designed to optimize creator and viewer experiences on the platform. The algorithm presumably does this by learning viewer habits and preferences and aggregating content it believes would be of interest to the viewer. For the creator, the algorithm offers an opportunity to reach the viewers that would be most interested in the content the creator produces. In theory, the algorithm enhances both ends of the media exchange. In practice, however, the algorithm's role in the platform is not passive, it is active. In choosing which content warrants promotion, the algorithm directly affects the production of videos. It instructs the creators, albeit implicitly, on what content performs best. Through trial and error, creators learn what videos must be produced to maximize views. The private production of videos becomes a social product only by this algorithm, which ultimately determines what succeeds and what doesn't. In determining success, the algorithm thus determines the private production itself. Now the subjects, the creators, are confronted by this thing, the algorithm, an object that is external to them but nonetheless dictates and mediates their connection to the viewers. On the demand side, so to speak, the algorithm supposedly nudges viewers towards videos it believes they may enjoy. It does not do so innocently, however. Imbued with the intent to maximize platform activity, the algorithm promotes content it believes is most marketable to the widest possible audience. 
In other words, it intrinsically favors content with broad appeal and, most importantly, commercializability. In doing so, the algorithm entirely shapes the immediately available interface from the viewer's perspective. Barring a direct search via the search bar, the viewer's consumption patterns are driven by what is explicitly recommended, not necessarily by their own interests. To be clear, this is not necessarily a sinister arrangement. Many recommendations end up being pleasant discoveries, and in general, the algorithm may very well enhance the viewer's experience on the platform. The important point here is that the algorithm, again, directs and mediates what the viewers are exposed to and ultimately consume. Much commentary has been made on the algorithm's role in explicitly shaping the consumption patterns of viewers, to the point of directing users into rabbit holes of a politically pernicious nature. Consider now the switch in syntactical structure. The algorithm is performing the actions of directing, shaping, mediating, and so on. This is exactly what the subjectification of the object entails. The platform is being regulated by the algorithm in much the same way that capitalist economies are regulated by the law of value, which is itself a social algorithm. The algorithm confronts the subject, both creators and viewers, as an object external to them. It has dissolved the connections between the subjects and takes on the role of regulator and mediator of these connections. At the risk of being crude and reductive, the algorithm generally tells creators what to create and viewers what to watch. It may not be worth belaboring this thesis any further. Suffice it to say, the symptoms of this arrangement are apparent on both sides. Creators frequently express a lack of agency over their work and creative process. It is precisely this pressure which has resulted in the discontinuation of many channels, either by way of exhausting the creator and hollowing out the creative process, or by simply shredding the viewer base of channels to the point of obscurity. Symmetrically, viewers have found themselves directed towards specific content, sometimes in direct opposition to their own preferences. The well-known story of the internet's alt-right is exactly the product of this dynamic. Impressionable viewers whose preferences were so shaped by the algorithm's invisible hand that they permanently altered their personal philosophies. Finally, though it is sometimes done jokingly, reference to the algorithm is usually personified. The algorithm brought me here. The algorithm killed my video. The algorithm does not like this type of content. Thus, the community of viewers and creators constantly reveals the subjectification of the object in its choice of words. Much like the various categories of economic thinking, the algorithm has acquired a naturalized character. The algorithm is described as if it is sentient, in the same way the market is presented as a conscious entity that makes optimal choices for the society that it confronts. To summarize, YouTube has become a neat microcosm of the alienation of production. Relationships between creators and viewers have become relationships between content and views, regulated by the algorithm, a force external to the actual subjects of the platform, but which ultimately dictates both ends of the YouTube experience. In an effort to appease the algorithm, creators are left producing content that only coincides with their interests by accident. The further a creator buys into being a YouTuber, the more the force of the algorithm dictates their activities. Viewers, in turn, make increasingly fewer choices about their consumption of media, at times to great detriment of their own psyche. Before we close, it's worth climbing off the stage of the theater. Not everything in this analogy works perfectly, nor does YouTube represent a dystopia anywhere near as dark as the one we experience in the real world. As mentioned earlier, the algorithm is impersonal, and as such is more than capable of delivering enjoyable content to viewers while also rewarding passionate creators for their efforts. Broadly speaking, however, it is evident that YouTube as a platform has generated considerable dissatisfaction and disillusionment. Here, we call it alienation. Perhaps somewhat surprisingly, it is Marx that offers us an insight into how this platform has come to be what it is now. Capital's tendency to subsume everything under its own logic has transformed an initially user-driven, user-oriented space into the YouTube we know today. 